the it's inevitable it's going to happen to all of us none of us are going to skip the death and dying part so you know once we've accepted that i really do believe it makes living a, a huge amount more enjoyable because you're not carrying that burden around the whole time Welcome to the Death Science Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy, and here we explore new perspectives on life, death, dying, and the dead. Please like, share, and subscribe to support. You can find the audio on all major podcast platforms, and you can find the video at www.deathscience.tv. You can learn more about the show at www.deathscience.org. Welcome to episode number 14. Today's guest is Jean Francis. We'll be covering topics like her ways of inspiring a creative funeral plan and memorial service. Also, what she did in her death cafe, her tea room meetings, and why she and many others in the UK and around the world support green funerals and so many more topics. But before I get started, I want to talk about catacombculture.com. This is where I sell my sculptures, my sculptures being functional home decor that I make out of hyper-realistic human bones. From human bone lamps to food safe skull bowls, I make a lot of memento mori friendly pieces that can serve as reminders that our lifespans are limited, so let's make the best out of the time that we have left. You can explore my bone gallery at catacombculture.com. Also, restinggrounds.org will guide you in exploring alternative post-life care for your deceased body. Your deceased body has the potential to literally save lives, advance multiple fields of science, and so much more. Learn more at www.restinggrounds.org. Now, let's meet Jean and explore new perspectives on life, death, dying, and the dead. So today we're here with Jean Francis, who is the founder, chair, and inspirational director at Last Wishes Live Your Legacy. You could also learn more about this at www.lastwishes.world. Hey, Jean, thanks for coming to the Death Science Podcast. How are you this morning? Good, thank you. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Okay. Um, well, I last started dreaming of last wishes probably 30 years ago when i went to the funerals of two elderly gentlemen who had pre-arranged their funerals long before there was a need and on both occasions i emerged feeling totally elated they were just the most extraordinary experiences and i realized how very healing a funeral could be and that is now my mission. It's taken a long while, but we're nearly there. Mm. What about the funerals did you find most healing? The two that I've really based my, um, my journey on, um, one gentleman, he was a spiritualist, and I used to go to the spiritualist church. And he always um, handed around a bag of sweetish, usually fruit drop, drops or something, before the service. And when we went in, we were all sucking our sweeties and singing and doing what you do. And um, when I heard it was his funeral, um, I said to the minister, shall I bring the sweeties? And she said, oh, yes. And so I took the sweeties along and handed them around outside the crematorium. And it was just a very simple thing, really, but everybody just loved it. And they found singing all things bright and beautiful with a mouthful of sweeties really quite amusing. And everybody got the giggles. And this guy would have just loved it. Well, I'm sure he was there in spirit. And, um, and then... Uh, Oh, by the way, he had said to everyone, please wear party frocks. I'll come back and haunt you if you wear black. So everybody was there in the right mood to, to begin with. And um, then when it came to the um, curtain going round the catapult, it was Vera Lynn singing We'll Meet Again. And of course, that is a spiritualist, spirit, spiritualist belief. And it was just so beautiful. And everybody just 
hurrahed and wanted to sing and dance and he knew we knew he was in a good place and it was a lovely experience so that was one of them do you want me to tell you about the other one sure 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 <laughs> again it was um a dear elderly gentleman and his granddaughter arranged his funeral with him and we all gathered we all had invitations um to go and we gathered in the funeral director's gardens where it, it had waned overnight but they put out rows of chairs in the garden grandfather's coffin was under the um a little roof there veranda area and um the family conducted the funeral themselves and the granddaughter um introduced everybody and a, a, a nephew played um, an instrument, I think it was a violin or a guitar or something, I can't really remember now, but it was pretty moving. And um, then there was a very strange little interaction where Molly Malone, we all sung Molly Malone, and afterwards I said to the granddad, what was all that about? Then she said, granddad had a naughty little moment in the war, and we thought <laughs> we needed to bring it in. <laughs> it was so lovely. And then when it ended, and, and family members read poetry, there was no celebrant or minister there at all. And then when it ended, um, she said, will you all please go and check your car parking tickets? Because Grandad wanted you all to come to lunch at the Royal Hotel. And wow, we all checked our tickets. And um, grand, the funeral directors, and this is exactly what he wanted, took him to the crematorium because as far as he was concerned, it was just his old coat. Mm. And we all went by taxi to the center of town. We had the most amazing champagne lunch with just the most extraordinary food. And it was beautiful. Mm. And he and his wife, had in the past been to our restaurant on a, um, a regular Sunday um, lunch affair and they always drank champagne and apparently he, the guy, this dear old man, he, he drank champagne throughout his um, teenage years, I think. It was obviously very important that we all had a lovely champagne lunch and that was just extraordinary and again, probably due to the champagne, but we were all on a complete high <laughs> when we <laughs> met. And it was just, yeah, those were the two occasions. And I left thinking, I've got to tell the world about how healing and beautiful a funeral can be, especially if it's arranged prior to need, while you feel well, happy, in high spirits. It's no good leaving it. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. So tell us about where you operate out of, like what country, just so we can understand maybe cultural differences or even lawful differences when it comes to burials and stuff. Yeah. Well, I live in a little village called Billingshurst in West Sussex in England. Um, my two co I have several colleagues that started Last Wishes with me just over a year ago. I ran a workshop and they said, this is amazing. We have got to take this places. This is information everybody should know about. So some of them are in a um, town called Congleton in Cheshire. I operate from um, Billingshurst in West Sussex. And we have a colleague in Australia who, who left Australia England for Australia just before lockdown and so we um yeah have great representation in Australia already. Uh, how do you define a green funeral? Oh wow well this is really my, where my heart is completely. There are so many things we can do to create a green funeral as opposed to one that is going to um, pollute the environment and it's got to be the best choice has got to be where possible 
um, a green burial in a natural burial ground where a tree or trees or bushes, anything, you know, form of greenery are planted as a memorial to that loved one, you know, no, and maybe marked by a microchip whereby loved ones can follow up and find that place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's a case of using biodegradable coffins, of which there are many now, no flowers flown in from foreign parts because of the carbon footprint, dress the body in natural fabrics, nothing synthetic, and just back to nature, really, where we came from, yeah. Mm -hmm. So how did you get started in the green funeral industry? Well, I've been very intrigued from, from 20, oh, 25, 30 years back. And I went to, I, I heard about um, the Natural Death Centre. Um, which at that moment in time was in London, and they had an open day. I went to this open day. It was absolutely fascinating, and I got on so well with all the people there. We were all on the right, same track, as it were, and I met an amazing woman who had created a, um, a coffin called an EcoPod made from shredded paper. It was so beautiful. And as a result of that, I got chatting with her and she and another extraordinary woman opened um, a funeral directors in Brighton, which is a very go ahead um, town near where I live. And they opened a shop and I went to work with them from the very beginning. And it was probably the very first green funeral director in the whole of the country. Mm -hmm. And everything they did was just so amazing, so thoughtful towards both the customers and the environment. So it was a wonderful, I feel so privileged to have been part of that. What would you say are some common myths or misunderstandings around green funerals? Well, people say, oh, but the, the earth should be dedicated to the, to the living. Well, that actually is a misunderstanding in many ways, because we all know that we need to plant as many trees and have green spaces as we possibly can. And the idea of green burial is that the the space used goes back to nature and the trees are the lungs of mother earth for goodness sake we've got to have trees to be able to balance uh, the and offset all the carbon emissions mm. so it, it's just got to be a good mode and it's a beautiful place for loved ones to visit it's a natural habitat for wildlife Mm. And it's also probably the most important thing, kept safe from developers. So we at least have these sacred places to visit um, regardless. What are some other, say, funeral options? Uh, maybe specifically in the UK, maybe like, say, I noticed on your website, you mention about uh, churchyards, you talk about lawn cemeteries, urban cemeteries, private land, gardens and stuff. What are, what are some overlooked options when it comes to funerals and cemeteries? Well, the, one of the obvious ones to me is to be buried on agricultural land. And you what know, is... they're, they're unmarked graves. Mm. Um, there must be no change of use officially. And, you know, the, the ground just continues to be ploughed plowed over the graves. It's not taking up any extra space. Mm. And it can be buried in, on private land with the landowner's permission. There are a few, you know, rules and 
you have to check water courses with the environmental agent agency and things like that but there are, you know there are a few rules and regulations but very few in actual fact hmm. so here in the united states agricultural cemeteries is a not even thought about so what's the agricultural cemeteries like over in the uk i don't know that there are too many of them mm. i have this amazing book which is my bible oops can you see it the natural death handbook oh okay yeah yeah published by the natural death center and it is just the most extraordinarily wonderful book. I so recommend it. And in there, they tell us about agricultural burial. And it is fairly new to me, I do have to say, but I'm very excited about it. Mm. And you can be buried in your back garden, but you know, there are things that obviously there are little hitches there. Mm. So aside from burial, what are your opinions on cremation? Oh, wow. How long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> well, cremation is not by any way the greenest option in spite of all the, you know, government legislation, there are filters, and, but it is not a green option, although people think it probably is. But I do have to say, you know, if that is what people, the way people wish to be, go, leave, um, there are so, and this is the important bit, there are so many things that they can do to compensate the, um, you know, the pollution caused by cremation. Yeah, there's, there's you know, uh, we can't rule it out obviously because it's all part of what what happens but there are many ways that one can green up yeah what kind of um, pollution are you familiar with when it comes to flame cremation well uh, i hesitate to say but they're cancerous emissions and because people don't talk about death end of life nobody mentions it now have you heard of water cremation like aquamation alkaline yeah. hydrolysis it's got many names yeah, I've heard of it, yeah. now have you noticed do you have anything like that over the in the uk we don't as yet no i did meet the chap that actually invented or, or brought the idea um to the forefront and apparently it was used um uh, many years or few years back actually when foot and mouth disease hit the country and that's how they disposed of the animal carcasses apparently mm. um so i know little more about it um because it isn't available in this country at the, this very moment mm -hmm. Uh, something new here in the United States is human composting. Have you heard of this? I have heard about it. Yes, I'm very excited to hear more. Right, right, right. Uh, have you seen any kind of developments in the UK for human composting of any sort? Not as yet. Hmm. Yeah, I saw that there's a human composting facility um, supposed to be launching in 2021 outside or somewhere around seattle washington good news yeah mm. um now back to conventional burials um how, what are your thoughts on embalming fluids oh my goodness may <laughs> <laughs> again how long have you got years ago when i started um investigating the whole subject of death, dying, end of life stuff. I read Jessica Mitford's book, The American Way of Death. Have you heard, have you read that? I haven't read it. I own a, uh, yeah, an old school hard, hardcover copy, yep. Mm, I really recommend it because mm. she explains the whole process. I guess since then, since she wrote it, things have come on a bit. But um, it is, I, 
and and the, the beautiful company in um, Brighton called Arca Original Funerals, where I worked for ten years. The um, Cara, the amazing woman who opened, started that one of one of the two amazing people that started the company. She was an embalmer, and when she opened Arca, she has never ever embalmed anybody again if there is a necessity she calls an embalmer in but she saw no reason for having to other than on especially there are a few occasions when yes it is necessary but mm. she generally did not and in embalming started many moons ago didn't it before refrigeration and now we have refrigeration and embalming is just so intrusive. I couldn't bear any of my loved ones to be embalmed because it's just, it's just people need to read about it really. Mm, it's mm. up to me to explain what happens. But I, I would never ever choose that. And I repeat, there are certain occasions on which it is advisable, but generally I don't see that. Or, I don't think there is any reason to need to now. Mm. Now we keep the body at a cold temperature. So tell us a little bit about the uh, last wishes live your legacy. Okay, right. Well, oh dear, I've been sort of trying to, I've been running death cafes and workshops for years locally now. Mm -hmm. And I just, so I thought it was just so important to me to be able to get the message out there. And it was when I did a workshop up in Congleton in Cheshire, where people said, and, and locally as well, people were saying to me, you've got to get this out there. This is so important. Everybody should know this. And when they left the workshop, um, people had a workbook all a worksheet filled out with their final wishes and so that they could take that to give that to their family to the funeral director to the celebrant the minister or whoever and it took about six hours or more to complete but we had such fun we had coffee and then we had lunch and then we had a cut a glass of wine and people were coming back saying to me this is amazing I've never had such fun and you know, I've never, I haven't laughed so my ribs ache. I've never had so much fun in all my life. I haven't laughed so much, and it really was so uplifting. Uh, but the people that came were well; they were healthy, they were in high spirits. Very different if you leave it later in life, when perhaps you've had a. Um, you know, a, a, <laughs> a life threat, or, or you're getting ill and elderly and worried. Do it while you're young. You can always change what you've written down. It's not written in stone, but just give people a flavour of what's necessary for so many people. Um, I sat behind that funeral director's um, desk for 10 years, and so many families came in and had no idea what their mom or their dad or their sister brother wanted in the world of a funeral. And they were devastated. And it wasn't the moment to try and, ex well, for them to decide. And often it just broke. They broke down, they couldn't handle it. Whereas if they'd had a conversation previously, it would have been so much easier for them. So, you know, my message is talk about it laugh about it while you're well and be kind to those you leave behind just give them a, even if it's just a clue write down a few things so you know what they want mm. what were some of the challenges you encountered while developing um last wishes <laughs> well how i came to develop last wishes was I ran a death cafe in my local town for probably three years. We had monthly get-togethers. 
And at the end of that, people were saying to me, who'd been to every meeting, well, I must arrange my funeral. I must really get down and do it. And I realised I'd failed abysmally, you know, with running the death cafe. And so then I organised a um, questionnaire and invited the people who had said, who'd been to the death cafe and said, I must organise my funeral, invited them to come to my home. And we went through the, um, the process of arranging it. And what we have now to offer, our amazing offering, the last wishes has all come about really the questions people asked and the um, feedback I've had from the people that have been to the workshop. How would you describe a death cafe? It was started many years ago, the trend. Um, amazing chap called John Underwood um started death cafe is brought them i think from your country here i do believe they started in scandinavia and you know they've been going for a long while and it's where people meet in a safe place to talk about death and drying and end of life things because a lot of people just don't want to embark on that sort of conversation so it's really encouraging conversations around death there are uh, you, you're not allowed to lead anybody it's just a conversation so last wishes i developed from the death cafe um where people where i could lead people into conversations and introduce them to all sorts of different ideas and and choices really and the my the big um, hiccup, if you like, is that, as far as I can see, is that people don't know what to say yes to and when to say no when they're arranging a funeral, unless they know their choices. So now, at last wishes, we offer people all the choices pretty much everything you can imagine <laughs> and so that they can decide for themselves what when to say yes and when to say no and they understand the reasons for them saying whether one way or the other and of course it's saving people a huge amount of money because they're not being loaded onto a conveyor belt by a funeral director and coming out the other end with a huge price tag. I noticed on the website that you have a bunch of books and helpful resources. Uh, one of the books I noticed is called Time to Go, The Importance of Saying Goodbye. What are some good helpful tips from the book for preparing for a funeral? Oh wow, I wrote it such a long while ago, Jeremy, <laughs> way back in um, 2002, three, four, I don't know. It, I mean, it's really old now, but people still buy it because it's really full of all the websites and things. I don't know, phone numbers are all out of date, but people still buy it because mm -hmm. it's, it's 30 plus um, ways of doing a funeral differently. The ideas are still there. And I could add to it, tenfold now but there are it, it's just leading people inspiring people to do things slightly differently you know in a very deeply personal way a way that reflects their character their lifestyle their understanding of life hmm. so what are some tips uh, to develop a funeral that is very um characteristic of the individual perhaps what maybe what are some questions that you would need to ask yourself in planning a funeral okay um i'll just step slightly back one tiny niche for one moment um time time to go i realized wasn't a book people would read if they if 
somebody had died, you wouldn't pick up and read a whole book. So from there, I published two little small, two smaller books, pocket-sized jobs, one called Finishing Touches, and the other called, and they're all on our website, Ashes and Memorials. And I wrote Finishing Touches because, now to answer your question more fully, um, I realised that to pick up a little book with one idea per page was something people would be probably quite open to doing rather than reading a whole book. So in that book, there are so many different ways that one can um, individualise a funeral for a particular person. It's just 60 plus pages of people, little snippets that people will recognise and think, oh, my dad would like that. Oh, look at this. You know, and some of them are, are just quite unusual. Some of them are very ordinary, but it's just... When somebody dies, there's a huge amount of emotion involved, really, really hard, a family of grieving, there's so much to do, and their lives have to continue. So just to find a little snippet in a book like that can just set them off on another track. And when I'm helping people arrange a funeral, I always, and in our Last Wishes course, we encourage people to find a theme. You know, what, what for an artist, if you're a musician, if you've got a favourite colour, if you're a sparkly character, whatever, the, find a theme and then the whole thing comes together. And we've got, we've got in our Last Wishes course, We've just run the first one, which has been hugely successful. We're about to start another one in um, the new year. Um, quite early on, we go through all the, the legal stuff, which I find completely boring and uninteresting. But anyway, it's all part of it. And then we get to the sparkly bit, saying put fun into your funeral. And in there, there are so many different ideas, just unbelievable different forms of transport, um, different coffin. Oh, it's just, I can't, if you've got another couple of hours, I could take <laughs> through it, but I don't think you probably have. Uh, so in reference to your courses, what can students expect? How can students expect to be transformed from the beginning to the end? What are they going to be learning? Well, it's very simply just go onto the website. You sign up for the next course and you receive a manual in three parts. First of all, there's the legal section. Now, is that legal uh, specifically for the UK? It is at the moment, but I've got two people working currently in the US who are really very interested in, in, in um, noting down your guidelines because clearly they will be different we've got it happening in Australia now and we've also got it happening in Ireland and Scotland because all the guidelines are different legally so it's yes it's all coming into place so the first part is very much about the legalities and lots of information the second section is to fill in so that your next of kin can take it to the funeral director with your instructions in it, which again, you can always alter as time proceeds. And then the third section is about the, um, the ceremony, the service, the memorial. And three of us at last wishes were one spirit into faith ministers. So we've had a huge, very, very privileged training to um so we we're very very deeply aware and excited about the possibilities of um beautiful ceremonies you know they, and they can take place anywhere they don't and i'm sure that happens it can happen where you are mm. you know, they don't have to take place in a place of worship or a crematorium i mean here we go to the woods in people's gardens at home in a hall in the pub, 
you know, there's just endless possibilities. Yeah, mm. depending on the character, of course, whose farewell is taking place. Mm. Now, uh, is it e-courses only, like online courses, or do you actually do um, uh, in-person workshops? Maybe not during COVID-19, but prior? Um, I was doing individual workshops prior to, yes, yes. But since COVID, we've got it all online. We've got the manuals um, are sent out weekly for, I think it's six weeks. We've got video recordings and we have Zoom meetings where we all meet up. Maybe we have a lovely meditation and we discuss how people are getting on, if anyone's got any worries, concerns, which works very, has worked so far. We're nearing the end of the first course and um, judging by the feedback, we will know how's best to run the second course, which will be in the new year. So that can be accessed from wherever. Any any owner of a Zoom <laughs> mm. screen can access it, yeah. Um, also, I noticed on your website, you have a section called Tea Rooms. Oh, yes. Well, that was something we started very exciting early on. And this has only been created within just over a year. It's taken me 30 years to get here, but this amazing team, just incredible people and a lot of synchronicity, <laughs> help from wherever. Yeah. Um, it, it, yes, it's all happened. And so to start with, we realised we have simply got to start a conversation about death and dying and an end of life matters. And to do it we had this set of cards made i have one here i can show you which are just being produced at this very moment as we speak hopefully through crowdfunding mm. last wishes yeah mm -hmm. and on the back we have a question and at each tea room online tea room we draw a card and um on this question, this question is, have you compiled a bucket list of things you want to do before you die? If so, what have you included? And we talk about it. And it is just beautiful, the things people bring. It provokes thought, inspiration. And we just love doing it. We start with a little meditation, just a brief one. We light a candle. And we introduce ourselves and we share. And we've got one happening next Wednesday. So anyone can join it. Mm. Yeah. Uh, how often does the tea room meet? About every three weeks we do at the moment. The next mm. one is next Wednesday between 11 and 12 GMC. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And people could join just by visiting the website and learning more there? Um, well, we've recently started um, doing the invitation through Eventbrite. Do you have Eventbrite? Uh, yeah, I think so. Oh. Well, I can, I, when it's up, I can send you the link. Sure, sure. If you'd like me to, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And people, you know, from all over join, and it's just beautiful to be able to share um the difference is too because we have quite a lot big following of interfaith ministers our colleagues from ireland and the sharing they are bringing in because it's so different even in ireland the the um the still a very sort of catholic country and so to start something new there is you know quite a big thing but it's absolutely fascinating the stories people bring and share and they're very often stories that the majority of people don't necessarily want to listen to, but we do. Yeah. They're really, really loving it every minute of it, yeah. Uh, what would you say is your, was your earliest encounter with death? Or maybe how, some feelings that it may have sparked and in, uh, initial oh. intrigues? Oh, my goodness, mate. In 2012, I won an award for the most 
outstanding understanding of death or something like that, which was a massive, massive honour. I had no idea. And I didn't know how to respond when I went up to receive my award. And all I could do, it was so pathetic, I said, oh, God, when I was a little girl, I used to cry when flowers in the bars died. <laughs> and here I, I don't know why I'm standing here. So I was only knee high to a grasshopper, probably. And I was so emotional, so deeply, deeply emotional and shy. Um, yeah, and it actually was when my darling dad died. I think I spent my entire childhood fearing, dreading the moment that he might die. I used to ask God um, uh, in my prayers that if any if dad died, please could I die with him? You know, I just couldn't mm. bear the thoughts of life without him. But when he did. He always said, well, I can no longer pull up my trousers. That, you know, that's it. And he was true to his word, bless his heart. Sorry, I'm having a little tear here now. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but when he, he did die, I went to the library, as you do, you know, you just go up shopping, go to the library. And this book fell at my feet written by the famous healer harry edwards and my dad had taken my brother to harry edwards years and years before so i was very familiar with the name and he was as well obviously my dad and i read that book and i just knew that my darling dad was in safe hands it's a book that's been channeled by harry edwards and I now live not far from the Harry Edwards Centre, which is really lovely. Anyway, um, that just made me feel so much better. It was just such a beautiful read, and I just knew that all was well. And then there were several other incidents afterwards, including um, at the, I was going to the Spiritualist Church at the time, um, the medium came straight to me. And it was the first time that a friend said, I'm going to the spiritualist church, do you want to come? I thought, oh, I've never been before, but yes, I'll come. And it was my first visit, so I was really quite naive. I really didn't know what to expect. But the medium said, I've got this elderly gentleman with his dog with me. It, he described my dad and his dog. And the dog had the most extraordinarily unusual markings. Nobody could have dreamt it. And he described this dog and dad and said, this, this man is waving a white handkerchief. He's saying, I've got to give you this. And nobody, nobody could have known that as dad got older, he used to take his dog for a walk. And he, when he got to the end of the pathway, he would hang his handkerchief on a hawthorn bush. He and the dog would walk back to the stile. Dad would sit on the stile and send the dog back, go get that hanky, and the dog would double its walk. Nobody could have possibly known that. So it's, for me, that was just extraordinarily comforting. And I have had similar yeah, met the sort of experiences since. I just know he's, he's okay, yeah. When individuals are maybe going through a moment of grief, they're trying to cope with grief, uh, what would you suggest individuals do to perhaps maintain a healthy lifestyle through, through their grief? Talk about the person often. You know, talk to them. Yeah have photographs, honour the photographs. I've just created um, a, a little altar in my sitting room. I had it up for Halloween. Um, and as you know, uh, probably our loved ones come back in spirit to us through that very short period of Halloween <clears throat> when the veil between the, the work two worlds are at its thinnest. Well, I created as they do in Mexico and many other places, 
this sort of um, altering my sitting room with pumpkins and all the things that go with, you know, your Thanksgiving and Halloween and everything. And I got, I got really quite attached to it. So I've now put photographs of my, I've left the photographs there of the people, my very special people, my dad and other people. The service sheet of a very dear friend that died recently. And I've decorated it, decorated it as a Christmas altar now. And I've got candles. And do you know, it's really beautiful. And I think that's something lovely anybody could do, especially if they've lost a loved one during COVID. It would just be a lovely way of bringing them back. And even just to light a candle. And, or, you know, you put a photograph of them in their, on, on the dinner table in their place. Or just, you know, keep their light burning. Mm. So what are some good ideas for individuals trying to develop something like that? You mentioned a candle, a photograph, maybe what are some other good little things to include? Well, I think there's all so many different, different, I'm writing an article about it at the moment and making um, memorial flags using the, uh, for a man, you know, he, bits of his shirt or pajamas or favorite ties and things. I'm making flags. And so that, and in some of them, using a jet pack, I can't tell you exactly what, I'm putting an image of that person on some of the ties, that's uh, on some of the flags. So that that person will be part of every celebration that family has forever you know they won't ever be forgotten they won't ever be left out they're there with them and make a lovely mem memorial cushion maybe you know using logos of a t-shirt a, a football shirt a special tie a bow tie whatever is symbolic to that person um put it on a cushion you know, and that that can be loved and cherished, and could if people like the idea, they could either put just a little pouch of ashes in there somewhere. And another thing I have done for people is um, a friend of mine's knitted beautiful teddy bears, and I suggested to her that they're so cuddly that she could put just a little sachet, or people could if they wanted to knit these bears and put a tiny sachet of a loved one's ashes in the teddy bear you know so that they're really hugging there are so many things you can do hence back to my little book ashes and memorials there's so many lovely ways that people can celebrate in a very very simple and it doesn't cost them a penny very often mm. It's just full of ideas, yeah. Yeah, those are great ideas. Uh, through all of your death work, uh, what are some of the most important uh, things that you've learned? Listening to people, I think is probably the most important. Yeah, I can get quite carried away with enthusiasm and ideas sort of and I tell myself listen yeah because sometimes my ideas yeah um I have to it's listening to people and honoring the choices and also another really important thing I do believe is however much we plan our funerals which you know, encouraging people to do and find out all the choices. It's really important, and I really stress this. This is the biggest thing I've learned, I think, to leave a space for loved ones to be able to put their input into it, so they're not left out, and give them permission to change things if they want to, if they're not comfortable with what you've written. But basically, what you're 
committing to paper is a guideline for them to make their task when the time comes easier but to leave a space whether it's choosing the i don't know flowers the the readings the hit well everybody will have their own take on it i think so aside from your death work what uh do you have any other hobbies or passions oh my goodness yes <laughs> what, what are your what's say like your two favorite ones oh my goodness well my daughter runs um a charity called sussex green living which is all about eco teaching families children particularly because she maintains teach the children they'll take the information home to their parents about living a greener life you know it's their future and this is her focus and she runs um a repair cafe which i'm a volunteer at when covid allows she runs climate cafes and they've just bought a 1974 milk electric milk float to be able to take all the green work she's doing out to local villages and he goes at 30 miles an hour i don't think she'll be very popular on the lanes around here but yeah so i go with her whenever i can and i make recyclable crackers and recycled christmas cards and recycled oh and climate change scarves and all the different colors starting with blues and whites and they end up with reds and oranges and purples you know as the climate increases in in um temperature so yeah there's never a dull minute jeremy <laughs> uh, all right so moving into a new section here at death science podcast is what i refer to as the four horsemen questions so question number one what is the worst case scenario for your death that you can think of oh dear oh dear Well, I suppose a painful death, mm -hmm. a death where you have lots of regrets, things you wish you said, you wish you'd thought about earlier in your life, and it's the sort of not much time to put it all right. Um, yeah, to die with that I'm alone must be very, very, very difficult. Hmm. So question number two is, what is your ideal death? What's the best case scenario? Oh, for me, I'd just love to be snuggled up in my own bed, which <laughs> is in my backdrop here. And just to have my very close family there. But for me, to have animals is the most important thing. Mm. This is my neighbour's cat on my bed at the moment. <laughs> I've always had dogs and I've always imagined being snuggled up with my lovely golden retrievers and just going to sleep and not waking up. Mm. Yeah. Question number three is what would you pick for your last meal? My last meal? Oh! Um, well, this, this isn't exactly my last meal, but I've planned my funeral i bought my grave many years ago in a beautiful natural burial ground not far from here and i want everybody and because my background is in catering i want everybody to be able to have a a, a picnic around my grave with lots of champagne because i love a glass of bubbles lived on that for many years when i was catering <laughs> um yeah and have a lovely picnic round my grave i've ordered a lovely sunny day and i've also requested a glass for me as well not to forget me yeah and my daughter just incidentally she's got instructions i've got lots of junk jewelry none of it's very valuable but i love it and she's gonna offer all this to my friends just to help themselves so there's little mementos nice yeah, and that was uh, question number four is describe your ideal funeral, which, which your ideal funeral sounds wonderful. <laughs> oh, 
Yeah, well, I planned it lots of times. I planned it when I was writing Time to Go mm. um, for the first time. Then when I was doing my interface planning, I, I wrote it again. It was similar but different because in, that, in our One Spirit interface training, we, my main focus, my main excitement was we learn to be spiritual counsellors and also to create ceremony. But my real focus and excitement was on ceremony. And I, when I get chance now, I go and do funerals for um, friends round and about locally, um, which I have to say I absolutely love doing. So I loved writing my own funeral for the second time. And I've adjusted it a bit since because I've written things about my little memories about my three grandchildren and they cringe if uh, what I wrote originally was read out now because they're you know in their teens so I've re I'm sort of rewriting it on and off now for a third time yeah it's going to be a, a wood um a natural burial and initially I wanted to have a horse and cart I wanted my coffin to arrive on a horse and cart mm. so that the grandchildren could climb up on top and have a ride but now the woodland burial ground has developed and all the trees have grown. There is no longer for a room for a horse and cart. Mm. So um, I've either ordered a friend's EV van or the, maybe the milk flight. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? But it needs to be electric for all eco reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm having a cardboard coffin which I help many people decorate. Yeah, and I've asked the children to and grandchildren to all contribute with paintings and photographs and reading anything they like to it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. That's my little bit of family union as it were. It can be yeah. a very human thing. So as we wrap up, do you have any final messages for the audience? For the uh, as we wrap up? Yeah, do you have any final messages for the audience? Oh, yes. Um, talk about it, laugh about it, think about it, and, and just find the, it's inevitable, it's going to happen to all of us. None of us are going to skip the death and dying part. So, you know, once we've accepted it, I really do believe it makes living a huge amount more enjoyable because you're not carrying that burden around the whole time. And I often slip in when my family comes in, or when I pop my clogs, you can have that. Or, or when I'm pushing up the daisies, you know, I, I use those sort of phrases. And so they get used to it. And I think if people can do that, or even things like, oh, look, these flowers have died, or this lettuce has had it. You know, just using those words, I think, will help particularly children come to terms with the fact that, okay, you know, it's part of life, which it is, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, where can people learn more about uh, you and what you do? Um, well, they can look at our website. Um, they can look at my books, although Time to Go is quite elderly. It's got it's full of ideas that are slightly different, and they're all available on our website and on Amazon. I presume they are still, um, but the website is, is I know they're on there. <laughs> um, and join one of our tea rooms. Yeah, that's a really good place. And your website again is www.lastwishes.world. World, yes, yes, right. it is. yeah. Well, Jean, thank you so much, not just for coming on and chatting on the Death Science Podcast, but thank you for all the work that you do, being there for individuals, whether they're going through grief or they're, they're confused about the funeral process, and also helping the, the world heal itself. For all that, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me on your program, Jeremy. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for watching or listening to the Death Science Podcast. For updates and new episodes, subscribe right now. It's quick at the bottom of the page of www.deathscience.org.
Also, remember that we all must die one day, so talk to your loved ones now about your post-life plans for your body. Learn more about creative and beneficial post-life plans at restinggrounds.org. I'm your host, Jeremy, signing off. Thank you, and memento mori.